but he didn't rule out the first half. Either way, the starting gun on the long campaign has well and truly been fired. On Thursday, Keir Starmer outlined why he thinks he deserves the top job. We got plenty of rhetoric, but not much clear policy. Is he playing it too safe? Stateside, three years on from an uprising that rocked the free world, the fallout could block Donald Trump's bid to return to the White House. The ball's now in the Supreme Court. On the show this morning, he wants the keys to Downing Street and is determined not to put a foot wrong in this election year to get them. Sir Keir Starmer is live and exclusive imminently. Mike Pence was the US vice president forced to choose between his president and his constitution during the Capitol riots. He joins us for an exclusive interview exactly three years on and will have immediate reaction from the former British ambassador to the US, Sir Nigel Shymore. And while the election date is unknown, the budget is set for March. Could a tax giveaway help the Tories recover in the polls? Well, Laura Chott, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, will join us too. Plus, with us throughout the morning, a stellar panel. We've got broadcaster, columnist and stand-up comedian Matt Chorley, writer and podcaster Rachel Johnson, and a true titan of broadcast journalism, Christiane Amanpour. A very good morning to you. Happy New Year and welcome to the first Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips. I'm Wilfred Frost in for Trevor this week. 2024 promises to be a huge year for democracy, both here and abroad. Will it shine or come under strain? What is clear, whoever ends the year occupying number 10 Downing Street here faces huge challenges. A stagnant economy, creaking public services uh, and abroad two major wars. That said, uh, our, our votes should end up being counted. Our election should go off peacefully and our next leader should want to keep NATO together. Can we say the same confidently about the US? Well, we'll explore that with our second guest, uh, Mike Pence, uh, coming up. But first, let's go to our first guest of the year here on Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips, uh, the man who wants to be your next Prime Minister, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer. A very good morning to you, Sir Keir. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be your first guest of the year. Well, it's, it's going to be a big year. Yeah. Uh, a big year all around the world with lots of elections going off from, from Russia to, to the US and, and further afield. I am interested that uh, with all the challenges that, that we face here, we are lucky still to be born here and to have a vote here. Oh, we're very lucky. And this year, um, we see that in action because it is going to be election year. It's 2024. We've been waiting and working for this for a long time. First time since 2015 here, we've known it's going to be an election year. And the power goes to the voters. Um, and so if people want change, and I think they do, um, I can make that case. But in the end, it's voters who will, on whatever day it is, be able to go and put that cross on the ballot and determine the future of their country. I mean, the power of the vote is incredible. And it's a reminder that this year, um, voters have the power to vote for hope and change. I hope they do. But it is um, you know, important to remember that that power is with them. And, and, and you know, my message is if you want change, vote for change. The working assumption? Is the second half of the year? Well, when, when do you think the election will be? Well, I want the election to be as soon as possible. We're ready for it. I think the country's ready for it. Um, most people say nothing's really working. Public services are on their knees. Um, I don't feel any better off now than I did 14 years ago when this government started. So people want that election. Um, and the sooner it happens, the better. And now, you know, we're ready for it. I have to say, you know, the Prime Minister is sort of almost taking himself out of this sort of the working assumption is as if it's somebody else's working assumption. If he had a plan, he would set the date and he should set the date um, because at the moment um, it's very hard to see how him continuing government improves the lives of anybody in the country, so there's this drift. I can't help feeling that... Um, all he really wants to do is to get two years clocked up of his own premiership, and that means he's putting vanity before country. And so my challenge to him would be, you know, if you've got a plan, 
set the date. If you haven't got a plan, just get on with it as quickly as possible. You mentioned there your, your challenge to him. One thing we wanted to get out of the way at the start of this, this interview. On Thursday, you were asked about live TV debates. You said, happy to debate at any time. I, I wasn't sure if that was just a yes to the idea of open debate or more specifically a live TV debate. Will you commit now to a live TV debate on Sky News head-to-head -head against Rishi Sunak? Look, I'm very happy to do live debates. We will inevitably do them in the election. I think almost every election recently has had them. Um, you know, as to committing to particular ones, you know, that's to be negotiated. But look, in principle, the more exposure, the more the arguments are out there. We've got a very positive case to tell, and I want every opportunity to make that case. I mean, we've wait I've been leader of the Labour Party now for four years. We've been going at pace to pick our party up from a terrible general election result. Most people thought we couldn't turn it around. We've turned it around. Um, I knew we had to change the party, expose the government as not fit to govern, and then answer the question, why Labour? That's the part of the journey we're on. Um, and I'm very happy to go and make that positive case for change. Let's get into some of the, the details then and uh, start with the economy. Uh, you've committed to, to wanting to lower the overall tax burden. You've committed to, to doing so uh, when the financial, uh, the fiscal headroom allows it. When we're in that moment, when the headroom allows it, what's the first tax that you've got your eyes on that you want to cut? Well, the burden on working people is too high when it comes to tax, so that's where we would be looking to reduce that burden. Um, and, you know, frankly, the sooner we can do that, the better. But we do have to recognise that we now have the highest tax burden since the Second World War under this government, so we've got very, very high tax. Um, and Which one it, do you want to cut, it, it, first and foremost? Well, taxes on working people. But ju ju just hear me out, because... It was, we need to assess why is it that we've got such high tax. Now, I think it's because we've got a low-growth economy, because we've had stagnation effectively in the economy for 14 years now, and therefore we've got to do more than have a discussion about tax. We've got to have a discussion about how we grow the economy. And that's primarily why I've set out the idea of mission-driven government, purpose-driven government, and made the number one mission for an incoming Labour government, if we are privileged enough to come in to serve, to grow the economy, sustainable growth in the economy, and to make sure that uh, living standards across the whole of the country are going up. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's where we've put our energy, into those central missions, and setting out the first steps of those missions um, already, you know, 1.5 million houses to be built under an incoming Labour government, mm -hmm. 2 million appointments for the NHS to get the backlog. Those are down. goals, not, not specific policies. Is there one tax over the course of five years when the fiscal headroom is there that will definitely be lower at the end of five years? Well, I want to reduce the burden on working people. The only way to do that um, in the long term is to mm -hmm. grow the economy. What you're seeing at the moment from the Prime Minister <laughs> is he, he's floating tax cuts. Um, but he's doing that in his own self-interest. He's run out of ideas. They're desperately mm -hmm. thrashing around um, and trying to find dividing lines to go into the election. It's not part of um, a strategy for growing the economy. It's simply picking tax cuts that the Prime Minister thinks might create a dividing line going into the election. That is the wrong way to govern. Whichever party you're mm -hmm. in, it doesn't matter whether you're Conservative in, or whether you're Labour, to simply go down the road of... Um, desperately picking anything that creates a divide rather than having a strategy for the country it is, is, a, you know, it is characteristic of what's gone wrong mm -hmm. over the last 14 years. Let, let's dive into an individual thing that you spoke about on Thursday, the, the £28 billion yeah. green investment plan. So on Thursday, you said that if the fiscal rules don't allow it, we'll, we'll borrow less. You were pushed on LBC on Friday uh, and you said it was now a confident ambition watered yeah. down from previously an outright pledge. In that, are you saying that the economy, in the short term at least, is more important than, than the environment? They're both important, but obviously the two have to go together. What I am saying is that we are determined to achieve our mission. We've got five missions, five central things that I want an incoming Labour government to achieve, and they will be our priorities. Um, growing the economy is the number one. The number one. Without that, we won't be able to do what we need to do on climate change, on public services. That has to be number one, but very important as a 
second mission is clean power by 2030, which will reduce our bills. Which costs 28 billion. Well, will reduce our bills, will give us energy security so that Putin can't put his boot on our um, throat and give us the next generation of jobs. Now, that will require investment, so uh, in answer to your question. Not just investment, by the way, because when we've looked with those we hope to partner with, how we achieve clean power by 2030, they say to me, Keir, you've got to look at the planning. We can't get, um, you know, infrastructure up quickly enough. We've got to look at planning. We've got to look at the national grid, because that's much, much too slow. We want um, a proper partnership with government, so there are things we can mm -hmm. do that aren't investment. But, yes, we need investment, um, and we will put in investment, investment for the future. Uh, and that's where the £28 billion figure comes from. That's subject to the fiscal rules, because... Um, economic just, stability well, is uh, very, very important. Give me to go on a moment on this, because uh, you made it a pledge, and back in the middle of last year, when the government relaxed some of its net zero targets, you said the Prime Minister was being irresponsible with our future. Uh, and just last month at COP, you said the current government is shrinking from its obligation, uh, Labour uh, will act differently and, and take a lead yeah. on this. You're saying there is a trade-off between the economy and the environment. So, so the, the question here, which I get there's a trade-off, is do you at least withdraw the accusation of irresponsibility to the government and acknowledge that, that if not, you're being irresponsible too? No, I don't. Because um, the government is trying to pretend that the date on which an incoming Labour government signs a particular cheque uh, is what matters. What matters is clean power by 2030, keeping to those targets. I'm not prepared to move that date. So people keep saying to me, are you... And if it costs £28 billion, you're still spending are, 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 are you moving back on your goal? No, we're not. Clean power by 2030. But look, let me... You know, the, it's absolutely clear to me that the Tories are trying to sort of weaponise this issue, the £28 billion, um, etc. This is a fight I want to have. If we can have a fight going into the election between an incoming Labour government that wants to invest in the future, long-term strategy that will lower our bills and give us energy independence, versus stagnation, more of the same under this government. Mm -hmm. If they want that fight on borrow to invest, I'm absolutely up for that fight because I want to go to the British public and say, we've had 14 years of sticking plaster politics where they haven't done any long-term thinking and you're paying the price. Mm -hmm. I would do the hard yards of the long-term thinking. I'll borrow to invest and your, your bills will go down. If they want that fight, bring it on. Let's, uh, let's move on to foreign policy, uh, Sakir. Defence Secretary Grant Shapp said at the start of this week uh, that the UK was, quote, willing to take direct action in the Middle East. He was talking about repelling Houthi rebels in yeah. the Red Sea. Do, do you agree with that? I agree with the government on this. I'm treading carefully because this is a sensitive issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are talking to the government on this. Um, I had a COPA briefing from the government on Friday about it. That's indicative of the approach I take. When Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, he and I had a private uh, phone call that evening, and I said to him, we will, you know, robustly challenge each other uphill and down dale on most things, but on national security, on terrorism, on Ukraine, because that was a dominant issue then, uh, we will stand as one. Same applies here. Um, so when the government has already made a statement, as you know, of um, you know, in relation to what's happening in the Red State, we support that. We'll wait to see what next action needs to be taken. Mm -hmm. National security is the first concern of any government. It will be the first concern of an incoming Labour government, of course. Um, and where action is needed, we're prepared to take it. What I don't want to do is to sit here getting ahead of the government in an area where I've said, mm -hmm. um, because it's so important, um, we will, you know, wherever we can, work together. So there's one voice coming out of the UK. In the Middle East, obviously, huge conflict mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, and um, it will not help the situation in the Red Sea to have uh, political divides here that aren't necessary. Mm -hmm. Let's explore a bit more the situation uh, in Israel, Hamas, and how it's manifested back, back here in the UK. Do, do you think the protests that we've seen are just free speech in action that we should almost be proud of? Or has it bubbled over at times and revealed a sort of dar darker side of, of certain small groups of British society? A bit of both. Um, I'm proud that we have the right to protest and that um, on any issue, including issues where I may or may not agree with those protesting, people can take to the streets and protest. And that is good. 
um, and we should cherish that. Um, that having been said, within some of these protests, there have been um, pretty obviously criminal offences committed that the police have had to follow up on, quite right too. And beyond the formal protests, there have been um, a number of um, threats and abuse to individuals, particularly some MPs, which um, I'm very concerned about mm -hmm. the level of threats that are being made to a number of MPs, including some within my own party, but not just within my own party. Um, so I fiercely defend the right to protest, um, including on this issue, of course, but I don't think we can escape the fact that there are these, the, these threats, um, not necessarily in the protests, but um, in and around, which we must be very, very careful about. We've lost parliamentary colleagues in the past, mm -hmm. um, and so this isn't just some idle discussion. It is um, a very serious issue. You, you said in your speech on Thursday um, that, that you want to find, quote, a politics that treads a little lighter on all of our lives. Ha have, whether it's because of the Middle East issue or broadly, has it been, politics been a bit overwhelming for, for you and your family of late? I think it's been overwhelming for many uh, people across Britain. If you go down the road of nationalism or populism, you've always got something, you've got to find an enemy, you've got to hate and you've got to constantly be in a fight and conflict. That's exhausting um, for many, many people. And I, that's why I said we should tread more lightly. Try and find the points of unity, stop the division. I think um, that reflects the British public, by the way. I think mm -hmm. by and large people, they have opinions, but they're pretty tolerant. They'd rather work together than not work together. I also have one eye on the future. I'm absolutely determined to have a, a mission-driven government. A, a, I've argued for a decade of national renewal mm -hmm. versus the decline we've seen for the last 14 years. Decade shows it will take time. Renewal, that it's not just to fix the country, but to take it forward, to make it a mm -hmm. better place. The national bit in the middle is really important. What I'm indicating there is, for this to work, I know that people who aren't tribally Labour... Um, who wouldn't normally necessarily vote Labour, but want to see their country improve, can be part of a wider project. So, yes, I think it reflects the politics of our country. I think we've had too much division, too mm. much of this, um, ramming everything down your throat the whole time, finding enemies all the time, divide, 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 wedge, wedge, wedge. We're very much in this place with this government. want to lift that to a better place but to do it with a purpose, which is to say there can be a national project here mm -hmm. that you can be part of, even if you're not tribally Labour. Um, clearly we know about uh, all of your front bench and the people that support you there. Lots of people behind the scenes within the Labour Party that support you too, that I've been speaking to at times this week. W what about behind the scenes at home? If, if you were to make it to the top, to being Prime Minister, how much would you owe to your family for the support they give you to your wife? Oh, everything. Um, absolutely everything. Vic, my wife, is fantastic. Um, she is my complete support and partner um, in this. Um, she doesn't do anything publicly. She wants to get on with her job. She works for the NHS. We've got two relatively young children. A boy is 15, a boy is 13. But it impacts them all of the time, every single day. Um, and all of that I do, I talk through with Vic. Um, all the big decisions are ones which we sit and talk through um, at home. And that is a good thing. Uh, it's a, I'm not sure she signed up for this. Uh, when I finished as Chief Prosecutor, Director of Public Prosecutions, and was thinking about going into politics, she was sort of ringing out her job adverts, you know, to go and carry on doing something in the law. Um, so she didn't necessarily sign up to it, but she's absolutely centrally part of it. The, the, and I'm, you know, we've waited a long time for 2024. I'm really glad this year is mm -hmm. here. Um, I want this fight. The only thing that sort of keeps me up at night, the only thing that worries me is our children, because they're 13 and 15. That's difficult ages. Mm. It will impact them. We don't name them in public. We don't do photographs with them. They go to the local school and are just desperately try to protect them in that way. But I know it's going to be harder, and I, and I do worry about that. Well, your, your, your wife particularly sounds like an amazing lady, and, and to all your family, we thank, we thank them for sharing you with us on, <laughs> on a weekend day, and I hope you have a fun rest of weekend lined up. Presumably, 
a bit of watching Arsenal this afternoon? I'm going to Arsenal this afternoon to watch them play Liverpool and uh, we desperately need a win. Well, I mean, I have to be uh, impartial for most of the job, but I can agree with you on that. I, I very much uh, <laughs> hope uh, Arsenal deliver victory uh, this afternoon. Um, to, to wrap things up, Sikir, I mean, you've said very clearly, you know, bring it on. Uh, you've also said uh, in your speech earlier this week that the biggest challenge we face, bar none, is apathy. Yeah. I think it's fair to say at the top of this interview, you wouldn't give me a tax that you're definitely going to cut. We've seen your party usher in the government's changes to immigration without a vote against it last month. Um, do, do you think that if there is apathy uh, and there is low turnout, that it's actually on you playing it a bit safe? No, I don't think that. I think it's a reflection of the last 14 years of government. I mean, we've got very strong... I want to go make that argument. 1.5 million houses will be built under an incoming Labour government. If you are struggling to buy a house, that's worth fighting for. I want to fight for 2 million extra NHS appointments for those who are on the waiting list. If you're on the waiting list, that is worth fighting for. I want 700,000 appointments for dentistry, urgent appointments. Um, if you're waiting for an appointment in NHS dentistry, that's worth fighting for. And I want to halve violence against women and girls and that is worth fighting for. These are big differences between us and the government. They're all worth uh, fighting for, and that's why this is a year of hope and change. I, they, they are, definitely. Go I'd argue that they're goals, not policies. But, uh, and then ju just, just a, final, a final question on, on this note, because you, if you win, you really will have the weight of a nation on your shoulders. I just wonder whether you're feeling the pressure behind the scenes. Do you feel the burden of that? There's obviously been a burden on me in particular since I took over as leader of the Labour Party, a burden to turn our party around and get it to a credible position to win an election. And yes, I felt that because there's a responsibility to the Labour Party and to the country to put before the country a credible party that can act on behalf of working people. Actually, as we get to 2024, I'm in really good spirits because this is the chance, this is the year I know we'll get to be able to make our case. So I've turned into the year in, in really good spirits, really wanting to make the argument and knowing that in 2024 I get the chance uh, to do so. Positive case for change. No longer having to say, ah, oh, we'll have to wait, etc. This is it. Sir Keir Starmer, as ever, we thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir Keir Starmer there. The Labour leader. Lots still to come on the show this morning in a moment. We'll be speaking for, to our panel uh, and later in the show we'll hear from Jeremy Hunt's right hand woman at the Treasury, Laura Trott. Very shortly at the top of the hour we'll hear from the former Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, three years on almost to the day from the uprising that rocked the free world. Uh, three years ago uh, I kept the oath that I made to the American people and to Almighty God to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, but, you know, traveling across the country over the last three years, uh, I've, I have simply have lost count of the number of people who uh, took a moment to thank me from literally every walk of life, from every political background for the stand that we took. I think the American people cherish our Constitution uh, and uh, they cherish the liberties enshrined there and uh, I'm confident that the American people will rally around that Constitution once again and uh, I look forward to playing uh, uh, some part uh, in that decision in the days ahead. Well, with us throughout the show uh, on our panel, I'm delighted to be joined by the Times Radio presenter and satirist, Matt Chorley, journalist and broadcaster at LBC, Rachel Johnson, and a particular treat to have with us the 14 Emmy Award-winning Chief International Anchor at CNN, Christiane Amanpour. <laughs> Very good morning to you all. Morning. Uh, great, great to be great to be with you, Christian. I'm going to start with you. You have interviewed pretty much every major world leader over the last uh, 30, except for Sakia Starmer. Well, except for Sakia. <laughs> I know. I hope you you did some booking whilst you were here uh, for, for the next one. But but what did you what did you think of that? Was that a prime minister in waiting? You know what? I thought it was an incredibly good conversation. I thought it was actually very persuasive. If you start a new year, as he said, hope and change. Isn't that the Obama slogan? Hope and change is very powerful. And if you can actually stick to that and invigorate people and let them get 
if you like, infected by your own optimism. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Politics and the and the idea of, of moving society along. You have to engage people. So I thought that was really interesting that he, that he had those particular words and, and those particular formulas. I think the climate is massively important and everybody's going to be watching what the next prime minister does because as you see, the government has peddled back mm. and now Labour has to deliver because people want that, voters want that and it's actually good for the economy. Investing in green is good for the economy by all metrics. And then for me, given that I really focus a lot on international affairs. I think that, you know, our world is in a very, very difficult position right now. And it's going to depend also on who wins all these elections that are happening mm. in this upcoming year. For, you know, billions of people are going to the polls in more than 60 countries. Some of them are fake elections, like in Russia. Some of them will make a real difference, like in the UK, like in the United States of America, India, South mm -hmm. Africa. And they have huge, huge issues to deal with, the idea of two hot wars that right now nobody quite knows how to deal with. And Ukraine is being forgotten. Mm -hmm. That is where democracy is at stake. And we are definitely going to be diving into to lots of that as well after Mike Pence joins us. And uh, uh, ca Rachel, coming to this interview, one of the criticisms, particularly since Thursday's speech, but in general, is a lack of clear policy. Did, did we get some there or, or did we not? Yeah, well, just... I feel I should be reacting to Christiane's speech before, <laughs> before I should react to Keir Starmer's because, I mean, obviously, you, what you saw there was real communication. I mean, mm -hmm. Keir, it was a, is a, you know, that was a, a nice conversation and I had a few things jumped out when he said, bring it on. I mean, he also pointed out that unlike all these other elections we're going to face this year, the timing of our election is in the lap of the Prime Minister. And he's, he, mm -hmm. I think he rightly said that's not fair, we should have a date. And I agreed with him on that. He talked about house building, he talked about dental appointments. I mean, that isn't gonna set the world on fire. But yeah, the key words were hope and change. But then of course, Sarah Palin used to tease Obama a lot and say, how's the hopey changey stuff working for you? <laughs> of course, and she yeah, lost. Obama won twice, so it, did, it does work. Yeah. It, does work. Stuff it does work, but you need a bit more ballast behind the hopey changey yeah. stuff. And, and Matt, in terms of the sort of personality side of things, is this critical in this election? Or in fact, do you you think playing it safe works for, for either candidate actually so there's a big argument about this and it's an argument that i have often with with people of the labor party that you know the, the argument that keir starmer is is boring and he isn't connecting and actually he uses the word hope but then in the speech last week he sort of he was all caveated not a not a not a big hope you know frank hope mm -hmm. a small hope flickering um, hope. A, flickering a flickering hope, hope. A flickering, and so it's all a bit sort of caveated and careful and i think uh, there's a bit more today of sort of he was a bit more on the front foot. The attacking Rishi Sunak for not setting a date, it's vanity, he's putting his mm -hmm, own yeah. vanity before the country. Um, you know, because Labour basically want to keep up this idea, essentially rerunning what happened in 97, to get to the point where the country is sick of the government. And the longer it's drawn out, uh, the, the harder it, it, it will be for the Tories um, to hang on. Um, I think and, uh, there is a difference between being serious and professional and having integrity, which is definitely things people want from a new Prime Minister. I, I think being boring to the point that people don't listen to your message, aren't enthused about going out to campaign for you, aren't enthused about going out to vote for you, could become a problem in an election campaign because the Tories are not going to give this up without a fight. Rachel, does the Prime Minister have similar personal connection issues with the people as well? Is that uh, why it's OK to both Matt is it? nodding at me as if to go, yes, The answer is yes. I think, <laughs> I think Rishi is pretty slick on TV, but he has a kind of plaintive, why aren't you loving me more quality, that I think comes across as, as I can't say babyish because he's a grown man and he's our prime minister, but um, he, he's, there's a slight neediness that comes across with him. Can I just say one last thing on the green, the green mm -hmm. crap, as David, previous prime minister called it. Don't worry, we're allowed to say are that. Are we allowed to say that word? We are allowed to say that. I don't usually do this lot, so I don't I think <laughs> that if I were here, I would be doubling down on that because... The Tories think that the 28 billion, uh, spending that amount of money by the second half of the first parliament is a mistake. I think it's a great thing that Labour's got in its, mm -hmm. in its locker. And it's actually dividing the Tories, not Labour, because Chris Skidmore resigned mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of days ago mm -hmm. over the oil and gas drilling mm -hmm. licences mm -hmm. that they're voting on in the House of Commons tomorrow. Christiane, um, before we move on to the next interview, we, we asked Sakir there about potentially committing troops uh, to, to the Middle East, and, you know, he stood with the government there. I mean, the UK's 
quite an important country at the moment for both of these wars, uh, given lack of funding or political division uh, on different sides of the aisle towards them in, in foreign countries. Yeah, you know, I always used to say, uh, this is pre-Brexit, that Britain used to punch way above its weight because it was so important in NATO, it was so important in the transatlantic relationship mm -hmm. between the US and Europe, and it was so important in its military and its intelligence capacity. Um, I think for sure the United States is, 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 the, is the big mm -hmm. heavyweight now, and right now it's US and, in fact, the head of the EU foreign policy who are trying to prevent... A, a, a spillover into a wider war. But Britain has a major role to play, for sure. This is a topic we are going to dive into in much more detail as we go through the show. Now, few will ever forget January the 6th, the day US democracy was shaken to its core as supporters of then-President Donald Trump stormed the Capitol building in an effort to overturn his election defeat. The ramifications reverberate three years on and could thwart his bid to return to the White House. At the heart of it all was the then Vice President Mike Pence, who pressed ahead with certifying the election results while rioters chanted for him to be hanged. He's currently on a visit to Israel. And yesterday, on the third anniversary of that uprising, he spoke to this programme from Jerusalem. I began by asking him for his take on how the US has responded to the war in Gaza. Well, if I'm here, not just as a former vice president of the United States, but uh, really just uh, as an average American, just to make sure the people of Israel know uh, in this dark hour uh, that I believe with all my heart that the vast majority of the American people uh, stand with Israel as they, uh, as they do what needs to be done in, in the wake of that horrific terrorist attack of October the 7th. And uh, I, I must tell you that uh, I've, I've been grateful uh, for President Biden's response from early on expressing unconditional support for Israel. But of late, I, I've been troubled uh, to hear of, of back channel pressure that the Biden administration is placing uh, on Israel to, uh, whether it be to uh, have another ceasefire or to slow down military uh, operations. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I, I believe that this is a moment uh, where the United States of America needs to send a clear and unambiguous message uh, that America will stand with Israel today, we will stand with Israel tomorrow and every day until uh, the threat of Hamas is destroyed once and for all and peace and security can be reestablished for the people of Israel. I think a, a, a lot of people obviously um, raise the numbers of casualties that we've seen on each side. I, I don't think so, mat so much what matters is Israeli ca casualties versus uh, Palestinian casualties, but in, in your eyes, uh, is the number of civilian casualties that we're seeing per Hamas casualty getting a little bit too high? Is, is that a trade-off that does have a limit in, in your eyes? Well, let, let, me, let me begin by saying I grieve the loss of any innocent human life. But I believe the victims of this war in Gaza are also victims of Hamas. I mean, to, uh, to walk as I did just a few days ago uh, in, in, uh, in the kibbutz known as Kafar Aza, uh, where the most horrific and unspeakable acts of violence were perpetrated against innocent civilians. Um, uh, by some 3,000 terrorists who came across uh, the border, not just with the intention of attacking nearby communities, but as I learned in my briefings, uh, uh, that, that terrorist army intended and brought sufficient armaments to march all the way to Jerusalem, to march all the way to Tel Aviv and essentially cut Israel uh, in half, but for the courage of, of local police forces and ultimately Israeli defense forces, they were stopped uh, but I, I think when you when you literally walk the streets of the kibbutz uh, and you and you look into these homes and the blood stains and um, bullet riddled walls, uh, you understand that Israel is doing what needs to be done. Uh, and uh, I, I applaud their efforts to create humanitarian corridors, both for aid and for civilians to have been able to evacuate mm -hmm. uh, from northern Gaza. But uh, ultimately, I, I, I believe that the innocent loss of life that, that has occurred uh, in Gaza is, is ultimately, ultimately uh, should be laid at the feet of Hamas. And that, that's why I believe Israel must continue to fight 
until the threat of Hamas is destroyed once and for all. I wanted to touch on uh, the situation in Ukraine as well, Mr. Vice President. And, uh, and when you look at the situation on Capitol Hill about whether to send more military aid to Ukraine or not, what are some of your Republican colleagues missing when it comes to not wanting to give that additional support? Well, I, I believe America is the leader of the free world. Uh, and in my recent campaign for the Republican nomination, I tried to provide a very clear voice for the need for America to stand up uh, in that role uh, and give Ukraine the resources they need, uh, not only to, to fight, but to ultimately expel the Russian invasion. We simply cannot tolerate authoritarian regimes redrawing international lines by force. And I, I have no doubt in my mind uh, as I've told many of my Republican colleagues, that if Vladimir Putin were able to overrun Ukraine, it would not be long before he would cross a border of a NATO country where our men and women in uniform would be required under Article 5 to go and fight. Uh, so I, I really believe that it's in the interest of the United States of fulfilling our role as leader of the free world uh, for us to continue to support uh, Ukraine in their fight against Russia, and I'll continue to be a voice for that. The U.S., the UK, the EU, of course, they are the central parts of NATO. How, how critical is the long-term survival of NATO? Well, NATO is one of the great success stories uh, of uh, the last uh, century, the post-World War II world. And um, um, that being said, uh, I'm proud of the fact that our administration called on our European allies to to live up to their own commitment to spend 2% of their gross domestic product uh, on their national defense. Before we, before we left office, I think there was uh, uh, more than $100 billion more being committed by our European allies to our common defense. And I think, inarguably, it put uh, our allies in a better position uh, to support Ukraine's efforts to repel the Russian invasion. So there's more work to be done, um, but I, I think the way forward is to strengthen the alliance by ensuring that everyone in our NATO alliance does their part for our common defense. And uh, I'll continue to be a voice for that, even, even mm -hmm. as I believe this is, a, this is a treaty and it's an alliance that's contributed to the peace and security of the world for decades. One person, of course, whose commitment to NATO is questioned is, is that of President Trump. And you've made your views, both on NATO and President Trump, quite clear of late. Uh, despite those views, does former President Trump deserve to be on the ballot in every single state? I think the question of who's on the ballot in every state uh, should be left to the people uh, of the United States of America. I, I, I have every confidence that the Supreme Court of the United States will resolve those questions. Uh, they've, they've made it clear that they're going to take up the Colorado case. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I hope our party will give the American people uh, an opportunity for new leadership and, and give America an opportunity for fresh leadership in the White House. But uh, I believe those decisions should be left with the American people in the democratic process, and I'm confident they will. You, you mentioned the Supreme Court. They said this weekend they're going to hear that case as soon as, as next month. Will you and do you think all Republicans will respect their decision whichever way it goes? I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a great believer in the Constitution of the United States, a great believer uh, in, uh, uh, in the, the framework of government established they're in, and uh, I'm confident uh, that we'll be able to uh, see broad-based support for whatever decisions. But at the end of the day, I, I also just have great confidence that the Supreme Court will see their way clear uh, on this matter and, uh, uh, and ultimately leave this question to the American people where it belongs. When you look at the challenges ahead of this U.S. election, whether it's this debate about being on the ballot, whether it's people questioning the vote last time round, AI impersonations, Russia, China potentially trying, trying to interfere. Do, do you ever pause and think that democracy is at risk, even in peril? I, I have great confidence that the people of America are going to come together and, um, and uh, uh, you know, fulfill our obligations to choose our national leadership uh, in the next year. I just, it's my hope and frankly, it's my prayer that we as Republicans will give the American people um, better choices uh, to offer a, 
a new leadership. As I said many times back when I was a candidate for president, I think different times call for different leadership. And while I know uh, many of the pundits have already decided how things are going to work out, the American people have a funny way of making up their own mind. And uh, with uh, our Iowa caucuses and New Hampshire and other states just around the corner, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to seeing that judgment of the American people. But I'm, I'm confident we'll see our way through. And uh, uh, at a time that the world seems to become more dangerous uh, by the day, uh, I'm confident that the American people are going to step up and, and uh, ultimately give us leadership that will meet this moment. Mm. I, I'm interested, Mr. Vice President, you, you paused quite significantly at the start of that, that answer. And I just, everyone wants to get to the other side of the election. I'm, I just wonder what, what might happen between now and then if certain decisions or results go against cer certain groups of people. I mean, you were, on this day three years ago, the man, you said you're a believer in the Constitution, you're the man that stood up for the Constitution when things bubbled over. Do, do you fear things bubbling over again in a similar vein in the year ahead? Uh, I, I must tell you, you know, I, I know that uh, uh, three years ago, uh, I kept the oath that I made to the American people and to Almighty God to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. But, you know, traveling across the country over the last three years, I've, I simply have lost count of the number of people who uh, took a moment to thank me from literally every walk of life, from every political background, for the stand that we took. I think the American people cherish our Constitution uh, and uh, they cherish the liberties enshrined there. And uh, I'm confident that the American people will rally around that Constitution once again. And uh, I look forward to playing uh, uh, some part uh, in that decision in the days ahead. If we look at both parties, you mentioned looking ahead to the choice American people will make. Do, do you think, kind of oddly, they're potentially both about to choose their least electable candidate? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly remarkable when you, you think about where we find ourselves with the front runners in either party today. But um, uh, for me, I, I continue to be hopeful that when the votes start to be counted, uh, uh, you're going to see what I perceived when I was uh, campaigning as a candidate for the Republican nomination, and that is that, uh, number one, I think there's great appreciation for what we accomplished during our administration, and there's great frustration uh, with the way the Biden administration has weakened America at home and abroad. But my second sense was also that the American people, uh, the American people are open to new leadership, and uh, that's while I'm not a candidate myself, I. Uh, I, I stepped aside from the race to make room for others that might have a greater opportunity to do that. And I continue to be hopeful uh, that, our, that our party will uh, give the American people an opportunity for a new beginning. Because as, as, I, as I saw traveling around Israel uh, this week, uh, and as I, we all have witnessed around the world from uh, uh, the widening security threats here in the Middle East to Eastern Europe, potentially in the Asia Pacific, to the struggles in our economy, the crisis at the American border. We need new leadership, and we need leadership that can bring our country together and move our country forward. Um, Mr. Vice President, just, just finally to wrap things up, I mean, you've made clear your views on President Trump in this interview, but, but over many months beforehand. If he's the Republican nominee, will, will you still be voting Republican in this next election? Well, I simply can't support Joe Biden's re-election as president of the United States. I really believe that uh, the policies of this administration, um, whether it be the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, that it's emboldened the enemies of freedom uh, around the world, um, whether, it, uh, whether it be the runaway spending that launched the worst inflation in 50 years, whether it be a uh, the policies at our border that, have, uh, that, are, that are on track to see 12 million people come into our country illegally over this four-year period of time. Uh, I, th I think we need new leadership, but I'm, uh, I'm going to look for ways that I can do my part uh, to see that the Republican Party uh, uh, gives uh, the American people um, a better choice, a fresh choice, and a new beginning. And uh, I'll keep you posted on my position in the days ahead. Mr. Vice President, we thank you for your time. Well, plenty, plenty to get into there. And uh, listening to that interview was the former UK ambassador to the United States, Sir Nigel Scheinwald. Sir Nigel, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. So well, we're talking there a little bit about how democracy might be tested to the core. If President Trump 
returns to the, to the White House, presumably your old job, diplomacy, will be tested to the court. I mean, will we have seen anything like that in terms of the job that diplomats will have to try and keep the special relationship positive? I don't think we will, um, and uh, I think that's because, partly because um, a second term of President Trump is going to be even more difficult than the first. The first was bad enough for the alliance, for the UK. He humiliated the UK, um, um, you know, disregarded the importance of NATO and so on. But I think that the intervening years mean that this is going to be uh, a sequel, mm -hmm. and sequels are very often worse than the original film. So I think that he will be an unfettered, um, second term president. There'll be a lot of um, vengeful activity in the United States. And I think we have to take seriously his threats in relation to Ukraine, defunding Ukraine, in relation to NATO, maybe not leaving NATO, but not putting the money in that's necessary to keep it going. Um, uh, and he, the, the fundamental problem for any country trying to deal with um, uh, the United States under Trump, whether it's an ally or whether it's a, uh, an opponent, is the unpredictability and the uh, huge personal vanity that goes into every, every decision. So this is a new type of president. It was in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and it will be a supercharged Trump coming in if he gets, a, if he gets the second wind of a, of a, of a re-election. You were ambassador 27, uh, 2007 to, to 2012, at a time we all think of as pretty positive UK-US <laughs> relations. W were there, you don't have to go into the details, I'm sure you won't, but you're not one of these diplomats that now writes a book that tells all. But, but were there moments where the two leaders were furious with each other? And you had to help put out the fires? No, I don't think furious, but there are always differences and always have been in UK-US relations. So differences is normal, um, but the sort of relationship which Trump had with his key allies was fundamentally different from, I think, any American president since uh, the Second World War when the structure of international relations was, uh, was formed. And no one found a successful coping strategy. Theresa May briefly held his hand. That didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, Macron tried the, um, the uh, bromance, tried to, tried to woo Trump um, and be very friendly with him. That didn't work. The only one that worked ultimately was, was Angela Merkel's distancing from Trump and not getting her hands caught in, the, caught in the mangle of trying to appease him and not succeeding. Um, and I think as the rest of the world looks on, what we're aghast at is um, that Trump is the favorite to win the nomination, is at the moment the favorite to win the presidency, um, despite everything that happened. Uh, so I think that the, as, as Western powers and international countries look at this, I think they don't have an obvious way of preparing for um, for what will happen. There are things you can do. You can try and game what might happen on NATO. Mm -hmm. There are things you can do to limit the damage to some degree. But let's not be in any doubt this will be a, a huge weakening of the alliance and of the international system um, at a time when it needs that least of all, mm -hmm. when it's under such threat and uh, is in such the, a fragile state. The other question I had, had for you in, uh, related to the interview we just, we just listened to, and obviously you were advising Tony Blair as uh, key uh, national security advisor in and around two of the Middle East wars uh, before you were US ambassador. I mean, then the debate was, should we put boots on the ground? During Cameron's premiership, it was, should we do airstrikes? Today, the debate is, should we send money? Uh, I mean, what do you make of that? Are we quite weak today as a, as a military nation? Or, or is it sensible that that is the, the pinnacle of our debate? Um, I think it's inevitable. I think there's been retrenchment both in America and in, and in Britain and in most of the, the Western world as a result of the failure in Iraq and Afghanistan. They were failures for different reasons and they've had a profound effect on, um, on public opinion. I think that's, un that's unavoidable. Um, but, and I don't discount um, um, the validity of our military options still. I think we still have first-class intelligence, first-class military, but it's a shrunken capacity. Uh, and what's lacking above all is the political will to, to, to use that if we, if, if we need to. I'm not encouraging the use of it. Um, you know, I thought mm -hmm. that Keir Starmer saying that he was going to um, uh, act in a consensual way with the government and not get in the way of these um, tactical military decisions is absolutely the right one. Um, but um, no, I think, I think that, those, that those capacities are still there. Um, I, I think the fact that we are reluctant to 
get into military adventures in uh, faraway places is actually at the moment quite sensible. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's lacking um, is what Christian was talking about a little bit earlier, is whether Britain continues to pack that punch internationally. Uh, I, I fear that we don't as a result of a number mm. of factors, but one of them actually is America. Um, the country that is affected most when America's in trouble, when, a com when America is less potent, is the United Kingdom, because we spent so much of our history aligned with America, uh, listening to their view of the world, supporting them mm. when we can, that I think when, Ameri when America uh, is, is unable to uh, um, project its influence in the way that it wants to, it affects us and we get caught in the, in the cold blast of that. And that's what happened, what's happened in the last few years. And it's been reinforced by the weakening aspect of, of Brexit. So Nigel, as ever, pleasure to catch up. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. We're going to take a very quick uh, break here and uh, much more to discuss uh, on potentially a Donald Trump return to the White House with our expert panel in just a moment. Good morning, everybody. It is 8 o'clock. You're very welcome to join us on Sky News, wherever you're watching us. Chancellor will be joining us in just a few moments' time. Evidence of the cost of living crisis. And we'll start with breaking news. There's only one place to start this morning. Is the dollar ever. It was like night fell. It's 5 o'clock. This is the news hour. I'm Mark Austin, coming up in the next 60 minutes. Welcome to the Politics Hub on the UK tonight, throughout the course of the week. Uh, still to come... Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news.
Well, welcome back, welcome back. Let's uh, get the reaction from our panel uh, to the Mike Pence interview, to the Sir Nigel Scheinwald interview. And I guess, Christian, if I come to you first again on this, do, do you think Pence was a bit optimistic about things holding together in the US this year, or could it, could it bubble over? Uh, look, you know, Mike Pence is a dyed-in-the-wool conservative Republican. For him to come out and even, even not quite, but definitely say that he does not want Trump again is a big deal. He has put himself in the firing line three years ago on January 6th, and he did, and he's right. People do thank him for holding onto his office and being brave when people were calling to hang Mike yeah. Pence and he got no help from his president who was watching from the White House. So this is a big deal. The other, though, compa companion piece to it is that Trump, as you heard Nigel Scheinwald and, and you've heard many others say, is and he has declared that this will be Trump untrammeled. He went as far as say, I will be a dictator for the first day. He said, I will use my Justice Department to go after all my enemies. I am your retribution. What does mm -hmm. that even mean about immigrants? He said, they infect the blood of Americans. This is Nazi talk. Mm -hmm. This is really dangerous. And this is, he has declared what he will do. Now, some say your fears are just the fears of demented liberals. Others say that actually he is a genuine, real, and proven threat to not only US, but also global democracy. And the 14th Amendment actually says that any state or federal official who's taken part in an insurrection is barred from taking office and holding office in the future. Not helpful that two democratic states are the ones that have brought this issue up, though, for, for the whole debate yeah. around it. Matt, talk to me about the way prime ministers love to deal with the United States. I mean, is this something that could see uh, Sunak or Starmer step up to the plate? It's it's a sort of pinnacle of the foreign policy role. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The, 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 what is it, almost 20 years now I've been covering politics. And, you know, for the early part of that, Blair, Brown, Cameron, they knew, you know, and the White House called, they took the call, they wanted that photo. You know, David Cameron was desperate to get the photos with Obama even before uh, he became prime minister. Clearly, Donald Trump was a big turning point in that, and as Nigel was talking about, Theresa May holding his hand, and no, that didn't work brilliantly well. Boris Johnson sort of managed to get through that period, largely, I think, domestically, because we had COVID and all of that, and, it, you know, it wasn't there. Now, we're talking about two, two world wars, uh, two big elections coming up this year. I think it's interesting, David Cameron now back as foreign secretary. Be interested to know how he's adjusting to the fact that Washington is a very different place. Yes, there's a Democrat he can do business with in the White House, but what is going on with the Republican Party and t support for Ukraine is really difficult. The Labour Party, Keir Starmer mm. and his team, has spent a long time trying to get to know the Democrats, but this parliament's dragged on for so long that by the time they get into government, they might find it's the Republicans, which is a very, you know, lots of them sort of took to the barricades about Donald Trump. It's, it's interesting you mentioned the camera thing. I didn't get to this in the interview with Starmer, but Rachel, Starmer could bring back Tony Blair. Leave, leave the foreign policy aspect. I think that would be quite risky because, I mean, there are still lots of people who go around saying, you know, Tony Blair we should come back as prime minister. Um, we know David Cameron doesn't want to be prime minister again. One, he's in the I'm Lords. Sure they both would Two, he be. didn't even <laughs> want to do a third term. I mean, pro Donald Trump could, could actually decide he wants to be president for life. And, um, you know, the Constitution may not stand in his way. I mean, I think on that on that front, I mean, I mean the it does Supreme stand Court, in his way as we talk. The Supreme, yeah. <laughs> I know it does, but the Supreme Court will find a way to make to yeah. allow Donald Trump to to stand for election again. I don't think this this time round. Yes, I Not think in February they'll have to find some technicality. We we, we talk Otherwise, about... it will look as if the the courts are deciding who the next president is, not the people, and like that's not a good look. and that's a risk. Rachel, yeah. the thing I was going to just touch on as well, so clearly the special relationship would be supremely tested if this happened. At the, at the moment, the last couple of years, do you think it's actually been that strong, the special relationship? Um, not, not especially, no. no. I mean, I don't think Biden's particularly Anglophile. I mean, uh, he's, he's very... He loves his Irish roots, mm -hmm. we saw that. Um, I don't think he's particularly bothered with us. I mean, Donald Trump, as we know, had a, a massive crush on the Queen, and that was what he wanted, really. He really wanted to be president so he could go and have tea at Windsor, let's face it. And uh, uh, he no, that was it. A, that, he that was a that. silly thing. True, no, no. but silly thing to it say, was, nonetheless. No, no, I mean, yeah. I think I was covering it at the time. I mean, he absolutely adored yeah. that moment, there's no doubt yeah. about it. Christian, I'm interested in terms of what we heard from Pence on, on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Are the Republicans going to approve this funding? 
It's really difficult to tell. It's, as you know, caught up in a domestic political battle over the border. Immigration is a big deal, and neither the Republicans nor the, uh, the Democrats have fixed it over the years because it just keeps descending, much like in this country, <laughs> descending into the weeds of politics rather than sensible, real, proven ways to actually fix a situation that's only going to get worse with the climate and all mm -hmm. the migration from, from south to north. But I think what people need to understand is that when Donald Trump was president, just in terms of the world, he was was actually a chaos agent. He, it's not, it's not, it's not just we think he, he likes dictators, he does. He likes Vladimir Putin. If Vladimir Putin wins in Ukraine, the whole of our, as Nigel Scheinwald said, you know, post-World War II world yeah. order will be destroyed, will be destroyed. It is the most important battlefront in the world right now. And for the Republicans and the Europeans, to go back on what they said, which is we will support you for as long as it takes and we must not allow Putin to win. That seems to have gone out the window. And then, of course, you know, he pulled out of uh, the Iran nuclear deal. That caused more instability, mm. not less. He pulled out of Afghanistan. He, it was him who started it. Biden didn't need to uh, continue it. But here in also the Middle East, Americans and Europeans have to decide what is not just best for Israel, but best for the whole region. They cannot just allow this to continue as we see the US mm -hmm. and the Europeans are trying to figure out a way forward that will come to some political solution to fix this once and for all. Otherwise, it will repeat itself over and again. We are going to come back uh, to domestic policy after a very quick break. Uh, and we'll be talking to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott.
Welcome back. This week we had not one but two uh, set pieces from the leaders of the main party setting out their stalls for the next election. Rishi Sunak is uh, on his up as in the polls, but he's still got a budget uh, in hand. Uh, the budget date has been set. Let's uh, discuss uh, all of this with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott, who joins me in the studio. Very good morning to you, Laura. Good morning. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for joining us. So we just mentioned there that the budget date has been set, March the 6th. Yes. Was there much debate in, uh, in, in Treasury about where that was going to be? Were you influencing it with the Chancellor? I think it's a pretty standard date, to be honest. Uh, so it has been set. I think you know this is something that obviously the Chancellor decides, but it's pretty normal if you look back over a number of years of budget dates. And uh, I ask because much debate now about when the election date will be, of which course. is your the other Prime Minister has now answered. Which is, well, not really. It's your other boss's uh, realm. But is there discussion in the cabinet about this, or is it really he's the only one that knows? No, that is the Prime Minister's decision. It's his prerogative. And as so to you guys are in as much of a grey area exactly what he meant by saying probably the second half, but didn't rule out the first half as, as, as we all are. Well, I mean, I think we all now understand that the working assumption is that the election is going to be in the autumn. There we go. Working assumption is, is, is all we can get on it. So let's, uh, let's talk now uh, about uh, taxes. And, and clearly you've found the headroom to deliver a, a national insurance yep. uh, cut that's coming into force this weekend, uh, as well as some business relief, the, both of those announced in the autumn statement. Do, do you hope that that is just the start, the tip of the iceberg, and quite a lot of tax cuts to come? Uh, yes, we hope this is the start of a process. Obviously, it will depend on the fiscal situation at the time. We will only cut taxes where it is financially responsible for, to do so. But we've had a really tough time as a country in the last few years. We've had the recovery from COVID, the war in Ukraine, which has pushed up energy prices. We've had to pay back our COVID debts, you know, £400 billion of spend during COVID and then £100 billion last year. But because we have managed the economy responsibly, uh, because we brought inflation down, we are starting to see things turn a corner. Uh, and because of that, we are able now to cut taxes like national insurance, mm -hmm. uh, which is a tax cut for 27 million people uh, across the country, which is very good news. Um, I, I wonder what the scale of the ambition on tax cut is. The, 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 the tax burden overall will hit 37% this year. Uh, it's the highest since the 1950s. It's up 4% just on this parliament. Yeah. And the, the Chancellor said something interesting yesterday is, I can't get it back to where it was in 2019, four percentage points lower immediately, uh, which I hadn't heard him even reference that number yet. Is, is the ambition over the next parliament to get it back down to where it was in 2019? Is, is that the sort of target? I think when you talk about the tax burden, it's really important that people at home know this isn't an individual's tax burden, this is the overall tax burden, mm -hmm. it includes businesses as well. And part of the reason it's gone up is because we've had to pay back the COVID debt. And if you look at what we've done within that, we've increased corporation tax, we've brought down the rate at which you pay the additional rate of tax. We've really tried to put it on you know, the highest earners and people that can bear the burden. If you look at the average earner, for example, since 2010, they're paying £1,000 less in tax a year because we've increased the thresholds and because of the changes to NICS. So the distributional impact within that is, is very, very different. But absolutely, what we are trying to do is to manage public finances effectively so we can get that tax burden down for individuals. And it is the opposite of what the Labour Party are trying to do. You know, they have got this £28 billion of spend, uh, which they are saying they're not going to do via borrowing. So therefore, it has to come via taxes, which is a huge economic danger for this country. Um, I want to move on and talk about uh, the Rwanda policy. Uh, some documents leaked this weekend raised the question of whether the Prime Minister really believed in the policy when he was Chancellor uh, and the policy was first introduced. In, in particular, the question was raised as whether Rishi Sunak thought the policy was value for money. D does your boss, the current Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, think the Rwanda policy is value for money? Yes, absolutely. I should also say that like, I do this job now. I'm Chief Secretary to the Treasury. I scrutinise every single piece of government spend. Mm -hmm. It's our job in the Treasury to look at every single item of government spending and make sure, making sure it's value for money. So Rishi, when he was uh, Chancellor, and indeed when he was CST, was doing that. That's what I'm doing now. That is what the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is doing now as well. But if you judge people by their actions, what we have done is we've introduced a piece of legislation into the House of Commons, which is the toughest piece of legislation on illegal migration ever. Uh, and it's something that has been spearheaded by the Prime Minister. I'm amazed that you said, yes, absolutely, it's value for money, to, to, that, to that extent, because the Home Office admitted in December that thus far the Rwanda policy has cost £290 million for quite literally nothing in return. That, that is not value for money. Uh, but uh, as you'll know, we're spending millions of pounds on the costs of illegal migration at the moment in terms of housing £290 people. £290 million pounds for nothing. 
is value for money. But we, this is the policy hasn't come to effect yet. You know, well, we're setting up the policy right now. You know, the, the legislation it, hasn't gone to through the, the House point, of Commons. It's not been an effective policy. Yeah, but we've got you know, it costs money to set policies up. It's not in place yet, and we are spending millions and millions and millions of pounds on housing illegal migration uh, people coming over here, which is which is just wrong. It's not fair. It's not right. I'm a Kent MP. I see the impact this has had on children's services in terms of accommodation. It, you know, we've got to do something about this and. In order to do that, we do have to set up the Rwanda scheme. Yes, that does cost money. Uh, but when it is operational, it will have a real deterrent effect. We've seen the deterrent effect that the Albania scheme has had. You know, the number of... Uh, we've introduced a new deterrent scheme for people mm -hmm. who aren't aware at home for Albanians, which means we can return them when they come back over here because Albania is a safe country. That's reduced the number of Albanians coming over here by 90%. We know this works, and that is why we are spending the money to put the I, Rwanda scheme up and to get it up and running. I, I, I get that these things can take time to come into action, but this was announced three prime ministers ago, five Home Office uh, ministers ago, if I get it right, about a year and a half ago. It's cost £290 million. You, you say that the job now is to analyse what's value for money. Yeah. On other policies, is that acceptable going forward? I, I get it was announced by Boris Johnson, not by Rishi Sunak, but, although he was Chancellor, but... £300 million to not get anything for 18 months. Is, is that value for money? Well, like I said, it's not operational yet. I mean, the national I know, but, crime... But, but, no, but new policies that come across your desk yeah. now, is your job, as you said, Chief Secretary of Treasury, to, to weigh these things up. Would you say £300 million on this new policy, whatever it is, completely different sector of the economy, is value for money if it's going to cost £300 million to get nothing for 18 months? But it's not up and working yet. So when it is up and working yet, it, the National Crime Agency is clear that deterrence works... We know deterrence and returns agreements work because of the Albania deal. So when the Rwanda scheme is up and running, if it has a deterrence effect, it will be absolutely value for money. But it is not up and running yet. I hope it will be. I hope it passes the House of Commons and the House of Lords and we can get it into action as quickly as possible mm -hmm. because it is important. And behind this is, is just a fundamental issue of fairness, which is that you shouldn't allow people to come over here and jump the queue. We need to have an orga organised migration system where the government is in control of who comes into this country. I um, wanted to touch on the, the post office scandal. And yeah. uh, I guess my question on this is whether it is a failure of government that it's taken an ITV TV doctrine, a drama, uh, to, to sort of get the government, the country, acting to potentially try and right the wrongs of the past. Well, I mean, this has been a very long... I mean, awful, by the way, absolutely appalling. Um, and you, what you've seen, actually, over the last number of years is a number of very dedicated, by the way, MPs who have worked on all sides of the House uh, to bring this to justice. We've had an inquiry which has been set up a number of years ago uh, and also now a number of compensation schemes which are in place. But it's right, and it's an example of public service broadcasting, that this has got even more attention because of the programme that has uh, taken place. Um, to, just to wrap things up, we were interested to know that clearly you, you want to win this election. Clearly you guys believe that you will. I, I wonder whether the one positive to you, if, if, if you lost, would be the fact that we'd see the first female Chancellor of the Exchequer in, in Rachel Reeves. Would that be something that you would celebrate either way? Um, I don't think that is... Uh, whilst I very much like Rachel. I'm very uh, keen on women in public um, uh, in public positions. I think we'll be fighting every single day to ensure that doesn't happen. But, but, but <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a very good answer, to be honest. I'm not sure where, where I can take that. I guess, I guess if you win the next election and you hope there's uh, many more years to come, it's a job that, that you perhaps could fill one day. Uh, I think we've got a very good chance for the exchequer. Very diplomatic on both of these. You should take Sir Nigel Scheinwald's position in future. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura Trott, thanks so much. It's been Thank a real you. pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Well, in just a moment, we'll hear once again from our panel uh, on the biggest uh, election year ahead around the world. We'll be right back. Well, unfortunately, um, we're in a kind of time period where carrying weapons, getting involved in drugs, county lines, seems to be a culture now. Um, and once it becomes a culture, it's very difficult to just say to a young person, don't carry a knife, because it's actually part of their being. Now, how do we get to that? Many reasons. You can start at school exclusions. Um, we have so many young people being excluded from school. When you look at the stats, especially amongst young black kids, mixed race kids, there's a high pop population of them being um, excluded from school. 
you, you grow up north, you've got many poor white kids being excluded from school. So you have to look at the, 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 the skills of the, the teachers that are excluding these kids. Can they relate to these kids? Can they understand these kids? So we have to look at cultural training amongst teachers because the school exclusions, everyone's agreed, is a pipeline to the prison or a pipeline to criminality because they fall through the crack. They've got nothing to do. And of course, where gang members are concerned or young people involved in drug dealing, um, it's easy to get them groomed into that lifestyle. I wouldn't say it's just gang culture anymore. I say there's a lot of um, complex issues. One of them is social media. We have right now many young people who use social media to send messages and some young people feel violated by these messages and they react to these messages. Social media actually plays a real serious part into how it glamorizes this lifestyle, how it promotes gang violence, how it promotes violence in general and how it export, um, promotes grooming, exploitation indirectly. Nothing um, in life will tell you to be violent. Nothing. We are growing up, we know what is right and what is wrong. But unfortunately, we are dealing with social media that impacts young people's mindsets around how they think and how they behave. Now, it may not seem like that to us that that should impact them. But unfortunately, when your brain hasn't been fully developed and everybody agrees that your brain doesn't fully develop until you're about 25. So you're easily misled, misguided, and you are easily groomed into a life because you're not fully developed in your thinking and how you come across and your character and your personality. Welcome back. Uh, let's get uh, reaction from that interview with Laura Trott with uh, the panel. Rachel, I want to come to you first because have we, over the course of the last week, weekend, started to see a su successful articulation of a policy difference from the Conservatives on this issue of tax cutting? Mm. Well, I, no, not particularly, because even though Jeremy Hunt announced the uh, reduction in national insurance contributions from Topi in the pound to 10, the IFS at the same time pointed out that you will pay more tax in 2024 than you did in 2023. So I thought that the message is being slightly blurred. Are we also seeing, Matt, more reasons why the government is more likely to wait as long as possible to call this election? I think so. The, the, the weird thing, I think, about this tax cut uh, argument is it's clearly something that Tory MPs like, Tory members uh, like. And yet the big argument going into the election is going to be about the state of public services, about the fact that uh, there's massive waiting lists, about the fact that, you know, schools are crumbling around children's ears. And so, and if you look at the polls, the public's pr split pretty evenly down the middle between people who think we tax too much and spend too much and people who think we don't spend enough. And if the argument is about sort of restoring the public services... Most people know, well, that doesn't mean... You can't have, although Boris Johnson did manage to successfully basically promise this in mm -hmm. 2019, high spending and low taxes. That just doesn't work. Christian, uh, to what extent should Labour be careful? Uh, because the polls can be wrong. I mean, 2016, I'm remem reminded of 2016. I mean, it's a similar kind of vibe, but nobody thought Donald Trump was going to win. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, you know, I, I always say, you know, the Beltway is a bubble that is not really often connected to actual people's reality because 2016, 2020, plus the intervening midterm elections, all were, were called wrong. And so I think, as Pence said, you know, the American people have a habit of actually surprising the pollsters, which is why I think we shouldn't right now go into doom scrolling about who's <laughs> going to win and who's not going to win. And I will say about the economy, I had Kristalina Gorgieva, the head of the IMF, on my programme for the New Year predictions, and she said, 
I mean, in a word, cheer up, people. It's a new year. Inflation <laughs> is down. Unemployment is down. Prices are coming down. I'm talking about the U.S., but also, you know, somewhat mm -hmm. in the global economy. Big world shocks might intervene, but she was surprised that no major economy slipped into recession in 23. Mm. Just whilst we finish on the UK stuff, I mean, Matt, the surprise aspect, is this lead too big for it to, to, to lead to mm. a complete surprise? As in for the, the UK, for, for the Labour Party. I, th I think uh, that, you know, everyone looks to polls and it looks like Keir Starmer's going to become Prime Minister. Conservatives are not going to go, oh, right, fine, OK, you carry on then. Yeah, that's what the polls say. They're not going to go down without a fight. And if that means promising sp tax cuts that they will try to work out how to deliver if they happen to win, they will fight dirty. They're spending a lot of money on Facebook already in terms of building up. On Rishi's uh, Facebook on, on Rishi's page, Facebook, not, not on the, the, late, not the, not on the Tories. So I, th I think, I personally think a, a narrowing of the polls, it doesn't take much for a 20-point lead to become a 10-point lead. I think uh, at the moment, I think a hung parliament where Labour the biggest party is, is underpriced. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think it's underpriced. The other thing I think is everyone looks at polls through their own perspective. People who mm. didn't want Donald Trump to win believed the polls. Ultimately, if it's too close to call, don't call it. You know, the, 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 in following the trends, mm. quite often the clues are there. People just don't want to see them. Rachel, even the last election here didn't really go to plan because of the scale of the victory that, that was delivered. The polls were kind of... You're talking in. about the last general election, 2019. Yeah. We've had two leadership elections, I think, <laughs> right. since then. It's um, been very confusing. It has been. There's but been the a lot of were, churn. The polls weren't, weren't bang on for the On 2019, I don't think it was ever expected that there would be an 80-seat Tory majority. No. I think that was a surprise to everybody. So As was, believe... of course, the vote leave winning the EU referendum if you left mm. our equivalent of the Beltway. Do you, you believe seen... the polls this time? Where they are in the moment? I do actually. The other, I do. The other yeah. problem, I don't. Actually. I think that it is pretty nailed on. But then, of course, Hillary Clinton, as Christiane was saying, was nailed on in, in 2016. Then. But this is, you know, as you say, and 14 delivered... years of one yeah, party. I just, can I just ask Christiane one thing? Built in. If if Hillary was nailed on in 2016 and we got Trump, and Trump is nailed on in 2023, who are we going to get? Well, Trump was nailed on in no, 2020 no. as well, and we didn't get him. Uh -huh. Was he? Was he though? It was yes, close to that time. Everybody said but Biden. Paul's... Old man, listen, the same narrative. <laughs> Old man in the bunker, COVID doesn't let him Ask go out, blah, prediction. blah, blah. And well, he what, won. What is, you know, well, and he's the only one who's beaten Trump. I want to broaden this out because we've got a map of, uh, I think, some 70 countries this year where, where some wow. form of elections are, yeah. are taking place. <laughs> and, Christiane, I want to come back to a question I raised at the top of the show. I mean... Do you think democracy will flourish this year? Or do I you tell think... you what, it's really in question, I'm sorry to say, because many of the analysts who are watching this say, uh, right now there are potentially more illiberal democracies and dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, than there are actual liberal democracies. So this is a huge, huge indicator of where the world is going to be going. And as I said, the biggest ones are in the... Mo Look at the United States. Look, Russia is a fake election. Putin will win and be there until he dies. Uh, we've got India claiming to be a, a democracy. It's pretty illiberal. You've got South Africa, huge amount at stake in South Africa. North, all of Europe up there. Look at it, just about. And I might mention also Taiwan next. Yes, week. if that this goes year, wrong, right now. if yeah. that goes wrong and China moves in on Taiwan, we've got a, a war on three yeah. fronts. Do, do you think there's a risk, Rachel, by delaying the election too close, just after, just before the U.S. election? Or does that not matter? I've asked it, about this. Um, and that's not a big issue. I, are my my thought is I think we're going to have our election on November the 13th uh, after the US election has concluded. Matt, do you think global stage, whoever is our next prime minister, gets the sort of respect that British prime ministers used to have? It's an interesting question. I, mean, I think Brexit has played a part in that, if for no other reason. that The White House used to phone the UK as the, the, the sort of the, the, the gateway to the rest of Europe. I think in, in terms of democracy, and we think, you know, the, the problems with democracy are ha things that happen elsewhere. I think the big question is what happens after an election? Do the losers accept the results? Do the smaller parties, your yep. Nigel Farage, your reforms, uh, your, I don't know, Lee Anderson, does everyone accept the result and move on? We've seen what's happened in America. Yeah. The, the, bur mm. you know, the, the, the boast of being the, the home of democracy, accepting the result and moving on, is a really important part of that. And, and I, that's become a thing since Trump. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. become a thing around the world. It's been mainstreamed, and, yeah. and we, need, we need to be careful with that. We have just over a minute left, so a final year-ahead prediction from, from each of you, Matt. What, what, what's your kind of key call for the year? Uh, well, I'm going on tour again. I'm doing my stand-up tour. The I'm, first time I did it, you know, they called, <laughs> Theresa May called an election. The second time, war broke out. 
I'm going on tour again March the 1st, so anything could happen. I'm glad you plugged that, not your show, because your show's on the same time as mine. So uh -huh. yeah. people should buy tickets to your tour rather than tune in to that's all you need. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to plug, I'm relaunching my Difficult Women podcast. I wish this was going to be the year of more women leaders. And um, Laura Trock, she, you know, I don't think she will be the first female chancellor, but I do think we'll get one. Rachel Reeves, and of course, they'll all be doing my podcast, as you will be, Christian. And I wish I was going on tour like mad. It would be really fun. But you I can. think, <laughs> I think, and maybe. <laughs> Coming to Taunton. But I do think that um, I think everybody needs to watch the United States because where the United States goes, democracy will yeah. follow and the world order will follow. Sorry to mm -hmm. say, but that's the way it's built in. And Ukraine, 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 Middle East, yeah. Middle East, Middle East, both have to have full attention. And right now there's a problem yep. with potential spilling over. Well, yeah. Christian, since you didn't plug your show, I will. 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys all did it for you. A, a real pleasure to have you, you all here. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much and happy uh, New Year for to you and all uh, joining us. That's it for this week's Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. Trevor will be back next Sunday. You can catch me 10 a.m. Monday to Friday. It's been my pleasure to be with you this Sunday at the top of the morning. Good morning. Sky News today. It's 10 o'clock, the headlines. Keir Starmer tells Sky News he'd cut taxes on working people but refuses to say which one and says he's up for a fight with the Tories on his green screen.